Reshma Sajouni is the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code. If you haven't heard about this organization, check them out. It's an organization I've been looking at carefully because Eugene Lane College, which is the liberal arts college at the New School, is adding all kinds of coding elements into our social science classes, our humanities classes, our arts classes. And Girls Who Code is one of those organizations out there that's really thinking in progressive and smart ways. And so you'll get to hear from Reshma Saujani about that. She's also the author of the bestseller Brave, Not Perfect. Uh, also, Girls Who Code, Learn to Code and Change the World. You might want to check out her TED Talk, Teach Girls Bravery, Not Perfection. Uh, she began her career as an attorney and an activist. In 2010, she was the first Indian American woman to run for U.S. Congress. During the race, she visited local schools and saw the gender gap in computing classes, which led her to start Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code will have reached over 185,000 girls across all 50 states, Canada, and the United Kingdom by the end of this year. And it was recently awarded the most innovative nonprofit by Fast Company. She's a graduate of the University of Illinois, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and Yale Law School. Uh, the other speaker is Janae Ingram. Michelle Obama said about Janae that she is an impressive leader who plays an important role in our progress toward the mountaintop. Janae was one of the founders of the Women's March and served on, as head of logistics for the first, the original Women's March on Washington. She now serves as the director of national partnerships for Airbnb. She has worked in all kinds of places, long been an activist, now interested in technology. This is why these two powerful women will be in conversation. And Janae earned her Bachelor of Arts from Clark Atlanta University and her master's here from the New School, Milano, and she has a leadership certificate from the University of Kansas. Please welcome these remarkable women. Are we on? Oh, there we so. go. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's so good to be with you. Oh, it's so great to be with you, too. <laughs> and all of these fabulous people. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> oh, there's my cousin. My cousin, <laughs> <and> Robert. <laughs> I was, like, so. looking for my munchkin who's somewhere around here. Oh, there you are. Hi. Oh, yes. He <laughs> sees you. <laughs> so I guess um, we could start by... And we're just going to make this a conversation, and then I think at the end we'll yeah. open it up. If you or if have... anybody has a burning question, yeah. just jump in so we can have a collective conversation about this. For sure. So what made you start Girls Who Code? Yeah. Um, so I would say, like, I'm a totally weird person to have started this organization. I don't code. I was terrified of math and science growing up. I kind of blame my dad, right? He would like sit me at the dinner table and he'd like take out the math book and he'd like ask me what's two plus two and I'd be like, ah, I don't know, you know? And so I just got it in my head like really early that I just wasn't good at numbers. I wasn't a technical person. And I ran for Congress in 2010. I ran um, against a Democratic incumbent. I, I basically did what AOC did except she won and I lost. Um, <laughs> And as part of that experience, like, I just saw, like, essentially classrooms full of boys that were learning how to code, and there wasn't a girl in sight. And so, like, after I lost my race, and I thought to myself, like, of all the things that I, I feel like I want to work on, that what, this was the thing that kept popping into my head, and that's really how I ended up starting Girls Who Code. Amazing. Yeah. And how long ago was that? That was in um, 2012. Today is my seventh anniversary. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. And um, yeah, we started with 20 girls in a conference room, and now we've taught 185,000 uh, girls to code. We have 10,000 girls who code clubs across the country, and in the UK, and in India, and Canada. We have like 500 girls who code clubs right here in New York City. So it's been a powerful, powerful experience. What about you? Tell me about your journey in tech. Yeah, so I have a non-traditional path, I guess, as well, because um, as was mentioned, I immediately before joining Airbnb was planning the Women's March. Yep, I remember. Yes, you were there. <laughs> and I 
I didn't think that there was a pathway into tech. I didn't even really see myself like in the field of tech or, or at a tech company. Um, I had a mentor who asked if I would consider working with Airbnb and, and I was kind of like in my head, no. Yeah. But for her, it was like a professional courtesy. Yes, I'll, I'll do it for you. Um, and then as I started to learn more about the company, I realized that it was a tech company, but it was also a company that was rooted in a mission. And my role, the role that I would, was interviewing for and the role that I ultimately accepted was very much an advocacy role. So I, I often say my role at Airbnb is to be the voice of the community within the company and the voice of the company within the community. So just like this liaison role um, that really pulled on a lot of the strengths and, and things that I had built up being both an advocate and an activist. Um, I had spent you know, my, my, the earlier part of my career after I went to Milano. So, um, a proud alum mm. of the new school. Ooh. Yeah. Yay. Ooh. That, that deserves a clap. <laughs> <laughs> but I was working while I was in school and spent my, the early part of my career in nonprofit management, mm. the traditional sort of advocacy space, and then transitioned into activism. And now I, I say this role is really a transition just in sort of surface level. Like yeah. it's still, I'm still an advocate. I'm still an activist. It just looks a little different. So did you think Airbnb was going to, like, I feel like in some ways we have this romantic view or we used to have a romantic view about tech, right? That they're there to like change the world and save the world. Like, like what, how do you feel like being there? Is that? Yeah, no, I, I actually still. And you don't have to talk about Airbnb <laughs> specifically. <laughs> no, I actually still feel that way about my work and like mm. about the company. Um, I get to work with our COO, our CEO. And when I hear them talk about things like ensuring that there's equity among our host community. Yeah. Like that's something that I can totally get behind because that's what I want to do as yeah. well. Or when, you know, they talk about the sense of belonging to me, that's the evolution of these diversity conversations. So often we're talking about diversity and inclusion and I often say diversity is being in the room. Yeah. Inclusion is having a seat at the table. Yeah. But belonging is like the next step. That's mm -hmm. feeling like you ha you're empowered to speak when you're sitting at these tables. Yeah. So you're not just there. You're not just like in the space. You're not just, you know, sitting at the table, but still quiet. You have that authority to speak and, yeah. and for people to listen. And so I, it, it definitely resonates with me. Yeah, it's so powerful. You know, when I started Girls Who Code, like, everyone kept saying, you know, we just have a pipeline problem. There just aren't enough women in technology. There aren't enough people of color in technology. And, and I really believed that. And so I was just on a mission to teach as many girls, you know, as quickly as I could. And, you know, very early on, when our, our model is essentially we build these summer classrooms inside technology and then 20 girls learn how to code over the course of seven weeks. And then we hope that they go on to major or minor in computer science. And then we host these after school clubs in like schools and churches and community centers and homeless shelters. And you know, from the beginning, I said half of the class seats have to be for people who are under the poverty line. And half of the seats have to be for black and Latina girls. Because those, I mean, talk about not having enough women. I mean, there are no women of color, yeah. right? And, you know, and so, and now that we have taught so many women and so many women of color, and my students still tell me that I can't get a job. I can't get an interview, right? I'm 4.0 at MIT, 4.0 at Stanford, 4.0, you know, and I still can't get an interview, it realize we really understand what you're talking about in terms of the lack of diversity, inclusion, or belonging, and like the impact that if we don't figure this out quickly, it's going to be on these companies and their products and in the things that we're putting out into the world. And I think yeah. that's like the next iteration of the problem that we have to solve. No, I, I mean you really hit the nail on the head. Um, there's an article that came out in Wired either earlier today or or yesterday, and it started talking about like. You know, in 2014, five years ago, a lot of the companies started publishing their their, their diversity, diversity data, data. Mm -hmm. and how there was this, you know, this thinking of like, oh, well, we have to or people saying at the time we have to apply, you know, the same creativity and like, um, you know, passion that we have about creating these new products to addressing diversity. 
but yet very little has changed in the numbers. And so, you know, to the point that you made, 2045, this this country, the demographics are going to shift and it's no longer going to be that whites are the majority. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, a, a majority minority mm -hmm. uh, country and demographically. And when we think about the products that we're making now and how those products are suited or not suited for people who are you know, who look different or who, who experience life in a different way and whether that's through a racial ethnic lens or whether that's through an abilities lens or whether that's through, you know, a, a lens of how you encounter the world and all of those intersections. Um, it's just we are not creating a world that actually allows people to belong in the yeah. world. And I think we have this false conversation about meritocracy, and we certainly do in the Valley, because it's a very kind of community that sees themselves as libertarian. So, like, all nerds welcome, but, like, all nerds are actually not welcome. And so the sense of really and not have the failure to have these honest conversations, one of the most powerful, I was a in the Valley um, a month ago and I was talking to the, or several months ago and I was talking to like, I was at Twitter talking to the interns. And this young guy kind of raised his hand and he said, you know, I used to always think when I saw, yeah, when I saw women in computer science that they had gotten there because of affirmative action. And wow. as I've started working with people, I realized that they've had it twice as hard as I have. And yeah. they're not here because of affirmative action. Yeah. They, it was harder for them to get here. And it was so, in, in my seven years of like speaking to hundreds of thousands of people, no one had spoken that honestly yeah. about it before. And it gave me a little bit of hope in this younger generation of men that are starting to acknowledge their privilege and the fact that, you know, it's not, a, you know, this isn't about performance. Right. You know, women and people of color are not, I mean, HBCUs have been producing black engineers for like... For a long time. Forever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right? So to say that we can't, we don't know where they are, we can't find them, it's just not true. You're just not letting them in. And I think it's time to start having that conversation. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and, and I, I think that like this generation of, of, of young folks uh, are, may have it for us. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I, I think I often, you know, as I'm around the country speaking, it's like you go into the room and you're having a conversation around diversity or equity and you look at who's in the room and it's the people who are impacted by the lack of equity, mm. right? It's mm -hmm. like, it's not the people who have the power or the privilege and can help dismantle the systems. Yeah. It's the people who have been excluded who want to hear how they get in the room. Yeah. And I what I hope to see is over time that the room starts to change, right? Yeah. And you have those people who are saying, I'm in the room. How do I leverage my own power and extend it to someone else? Yeah. How do I you know, use my privilege to help someone yeah. else. And that's going to be the real dynamic Totally. Shift. I think that, I, I actually think it's happening. I've been noticing for me, because I talk a lot about girls in technology and I talk about my new book, Break Down Perfect, I've actually been noticing a lot more men showing up. Good. And it's been happening over the past year. And I um, was thinking about this a lot, like what does bravery mean for men? Mm -hmm. And men have been saying, well, what do I do? And I was like, all right, here's three things. One, be quiet. Be quiet. Right? That's a good one. Like it's men speak 80% more in meetings. And here's the thing. Like we know the dynamic that happens in every single, like when it comes, it won't happen today. But when it, ha when it comes times for questions, the first 10 hands raised, men, me. And what are the women doing? We're thinking about our question. We're perfecting it. We're like, do I, this is mm -hmm. smart. Did, did someone already say this? Only to never get the chance to ask. And so what I say to men, like just give us a beat. Like just take a minute. Give us a second. Right? Let a couple of women in the room ask their, you know, use their voice, and then you talk. Yeah. And it's hard, right? It's hard it for is them. It's very hard. Yeah. But I, I, I've started to start recognizing that I don't know if they know how to be allies. And so I do think that, and I know we get sick of teaching all the time, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I do think that, like, they, that, that, like, I've been thinking a lot. I'm sure you have too. Like, what are some things that you can do that can help shift this? Yeah. I, well, and. Being quiet is, is a good one, right? Like, I think so often that so it reminds me of like a, a movement saying, which is like, if you're if you're someone who's always stepping up, step back, mm. um, because you're you're constantly out there, and there are other people in the room who, to your point, may not feel that sense of empowered 
rightness or or wanting to get it right, wanting to to appear sort of perfect and have the the perfect question thought out. Um, and and it's that. I mean, I think that so much of sort of where we are is 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 a really opportune time, right? There's a there's a huge opportunity that exists in this moment because there is that shifting dynamic. I feel like we see it in little ways, little ways yeah. here and there where people are starting to even have the conversation. I mean, 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, were we ever even no. talking about privilege? No. So we it, it, it is, it's there. We just have to continue yeah. to, to And push. we were certainly just trying to make the men feel comfortable. Yeah. And I think now it's like, okay, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. And it's okay to have men in spaces. I had this, we just had our all hands staff meeting at Girls Who Code last week. And this, in the, one of our, you know, one of my, my team work, my, my team, you know, he stood up and he said, no, people are like, why are you here? And he's like, I'm here because my mother. Like, my mother should have been a NASA, NASA scientist, but she didn't believe in herself. And the world was ready for her. So I'm here to make sure that, like, that doesn't happen again. And it was powerful that he was coming to work every day to stand With up for his mom. Mind. Yeah. Um, we also wanted to open up. Any, anybody thinking this questions, thoughts? Oh, right, right Ooh, here in the like front. It. Get up in it. Oh, there's a mic right over there. Hello, Janae and Reshima. My name Hi. is Brandi Kennard, and I'm a graduate student here at Parsons studying um, design and technology. I've actually taught the summer immersion program oh, you did? this summer in East Palo Alto, California. Nice. Amazing. So it was a wonderful experience, and I also have the book. Thank um, you. It's a good read. So my question is, can you give us an example from each of you of like a time that you felt imposter syndrome and how did you oh overcome it? Oh God. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I feel like I go through feelings of imposter syndrome a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of one concrete example. Like I feel like there are so many that are swirling. Do you have? Yeah, well I just, I wrote about one for my failure Friday. Mm -hmm. I, um, so I grew up in like Schaumburg, Illinois. Everybody in my high school went to state school. Like, nobody went to Harvard or Yale. For some reason, at a really young age, I was just obsessed with wanting to go there because I think that I felt like doors would open for me if I had that credential. And when I finally got there, I just, um, I couldn't use my, I couldn't speak. I couldn't raise my hand. I didn't feel like I belonged. I felt like my clothes were wrong or I looked wrong or I wasn't articulating myself the way other people were. I didn't go to the private schools or my parents weren't rich enough. And I just didn't, I, I, I just, I wasn't authentically me. And then I recently, I got on the board of Harvard, and so I had to go to my first board meeting two weeks ago. And again, it's like brilliant people in the room. And that, those feelings, and I, and I, <laughs> I had worn jeans when everybody else was in a suit. Um, so already I'm feeling like those feelings are coming yeah. back, you know, to me again. And um, I had to like, I was like, wow, like, I, I'm I'm feeling imposter syndrome all these years later, all this work that I do, all these things I do to talk and teach about this. And I just had to really kind of identify it in myself and talk myself out of it. But I think what you're saying is yeah. right. It's not, it's like bravery. You're not like done, one and done. Like yeah. I feel like it, it, there are a lot. It's, it, it's, it's a journey. It's like it's a, a, it's a journey. journey. It, it definitely is. I mean, I like, I definitely have a lot where I, where I could pluck from any period in my life. Um, I, last year, um, an example, last year my, I had a boss who's not my boss anymore, um, but he, <laughs> no, he's, he's a good boss. He was a good <laughs> boss. He was a sponsor. Um, he called me up and he's like, you're going to speak at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. You're going to give the keynote address. And I was like, me, like me, yeah. right? Like yeah. me? And, and I, I remember having these feelings of like, why me? Like, why, why did he ask for me to do it? And, and just really feeling like I didn't deserve it. Like, I couldn't stand in that room and talk about anything, quite frankly. And, you know, it's, it's positive affirmation and it's reminding myself of all of the reasons why I should be in that room. But it also takes a lot of time. Like, sometimes it doesn't happen until after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. Like, 
you go through this experience and the whole time that you're there, you're feeling like you're an imposter. You're feeling like you don't belong. And then you walk out and in hindsight, you look back and you're like, no, it makes perfect sense why I would have been that person in that position. And you just kind of have to remind yourself of, of all of the things that make you you, that the perspectives that you bring that no one else can bring and why you deserve to be there. Yeah. And I, and I think the other thing is you have to practice being imperfect, which is that what too. I write about in my book. Because you recognize that, like, I think part of imposter syndrome is, like, you have to bring it like that all the time. It's exhausting. Right. True. And they don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm a perfectionist. So, like, I, I feel like I could learn. You need to live with so, me for, like, a yeah, week. Yeah. I, I, are you going to do, like, a boot camp or something <laughs> where, like, maybe this is <laughs> you do, like, a boot camp for, for adults who are trying to figure out how to not be perfect? Because that's a real struggle. Yeah. And I do think it's something that women deal with more than men. Especially women of color, right? Especially women of color, I think yeah. that that's how we've been raised, is you got to do it twice as good as everybody else. Anybody else? Go ahead. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Liz. I'm actually a master's student here in Milano under nonprofit management. Amazing. Um, however, I'm of an age where I actually worked in tech way back when, before, right when tech boomed. Mm -hmm. Like it just crashed out. So traditionally, the, the, the roles of women were usually project managers. Uh, very rarely do you see women um, coding. So it's fantastic that you're teaching women who code. But then also, let's not also forget about that incredibly important and very unthankful role of the project manager, mm -hmm. um, especially tech PMs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, they're the ones who are guiding and moving the projects forward. Yeah. So they're not just the ones who are, are coding. Yeah. And that can be in a management position. And I'm assuming that tech companies have set up their structures a little bit differently. Um, even the women who are in sales, you know, being able to sell a project yeah. and realistically know what the timeline is and yeah. like exactly how to build something out. Um, I just want to um, ask if that's something that you guys are also teaching um, young women how to do, because not every woman or, or girl is going to be interested in actually coding. Yeah. Um, they, but there is a role for them to be in um, a part of a tech company, start a tech company um, that. Um, is greatly important. Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I think part of the part of for a lot of women, if when I talk to them, is why they haven't gotten upward mobility in tech in tech companies is because they didn't know how to code, and they didn't know how to communicate with the engineers, right? right. They didn't know how to like, and so that's why I think like going back to being able to be technical, not that that that's what you end up doing your entire career, but having that skill set. I think is often a way of kind of preventing that type of discrimination against women that often happens in technology companies because that's often used as a reason why. I mean, if you look at mostly all of the CEOs of major technology companies, they all came from that, from, from engineering, from technology, and then were asked to lead the company. Um, look, I, you know, the thing about technology or, you know, technology companies, they're basically like, um, they're like the legal and medical profession in the 1950s. Right, where not only is there not parity in the you know in the leadership ranks, but there's not parity in the analyst ranks. So I think going back to what you're talking about, the opportunity is not just to get to parity amongst the engineering teams, but to get to parity in terms of the entire cycle of 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 the technology company, which means that they have to be product managers, they have to have management experience, and they have to have technical experience. And that's really what we try to do with our students. Like we try to teach them how to lead. And so at the end of a girls who code program, it culminates in them building something, working with a team, collaborating, right? Figuring out like what they want to build and create, doing their research, making that product, and then pitching it. You know, so they get that sense of what it means to be a leader. As someone who's in a non-technical role in tech, I definitely think that there there's opportunities that exist, obviously, outside of the more technical side of things. But when you're looking at the tech industry, engineers and people who code are the value, like they are the most valued possession in any company. And, you know, 
as you're thinking about growth opportunities, when companies want to expand, that's the first place that they're going to look. Um, and so I do think that there is value in the, the ability to code and like opening up that opportunity and that range of opportunities for young women. So that way in the future, we're not dealing with, you know, the pipeline issues or the, the myth of the pipeline issues. We're not dealing with, um, you know, the limits that are placed on sort of how many women they think can code. But I do know, I, for me, I work with um, a woman who is not, she did not come through as an engineer. Um, she was a data scientist. Uh, so, but she is now a, a product manager mm -hmm. and she is leading um, one of our like most prized teams in the company. Um, and so for me, that gives me hope that maybe she can be that model. She can be that model, not just in our company, but, but also throughout the industry because the work that she's doing is really critical. And, you know, she's looking at issuing white papers and, and doing all of these things that would give her a bigger profile, which is good for the industry because it can show you don't have to come through that traditional path, at least in the, in the interim. Now, all of the young women that Reshma is training, we want all of them to have jobs coding. But if you're someone who's, you know, you've been in your career for a while, maybe you don't have to have that experience to find your way in. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you for your question. Thought I saw another hand. No? I don't know how we are on time, but I have no idea. We could keep talking. <laughs> how are we on time? Does anyone know? Oh, you have a question. Yes. So I have a question in the inception of the idea, right? Yeah. When you decided that you're a lawyer but you you've identified a need and um, and you wanted to create girls who code and for you to wake up and say, I mean, both of both of the um, the arenas that both of you have played have shifted systems for society, right? And so, how do you? What was that pivot moment where you let your conviction um, stand against your fear of like, if you know, if not me, then yeah. who, right? Uh, was there that moment for you both? And, yeah. Um, and then what what was the conviction? that made you decide like, no, I have to do this. Yeah. So I think for me, when I started Girls of Code, I didn't say, oh, I wanna build a movement. You know, I was like, I wanted to teach girls to code. So it was really about, like, I think sometimes we make the idea so big in our head that we talk ourselves out of it. And so oftentimes I think strategically you should just keep it small in the beginning and then just start and just take one step and then let it see where it unfolds. So for me, it was just that first summer, 20 girls, in a conference room, let's see if they last eight weeks. You know what I mean? Let's see what happens. And I remember I had invited uh, my friends from the New York Immigration Coalition to come in and do it, and we were going to build something for DACA students. And just watching what the girls were thinking about doing and what was happening, I was like, oh, this, there's some magic here. And then that's what inspired me to continue to build you know what I mean, the organization. And then, if, you know, I kind of believe if you're going to do something, don't do it small, do it big. And so then it was like, okay, well, really, what's the problem we would have to solve? How many girls do I have to teach to get to parity? And I just worked my way backwards to say, then how many do I have to teach this year and then next year and then next year and then next year? And so I, I think that, like, I think if you're not afraid to do something, you shouldn't do it. Like, I actually love fear. I know this sounds weird, but I feel like I'm motivated by, by fear. And I think that's part of what I write about my book is, is I think that we've been taught as girls to be afraid of fear. We've been inoculated from failure and rejection and risk. And so when we start feeling fear, it's, a new, it's almost like a new feeling. And we want it to just go away. And so we then tell ourselves the thousand reasons why we can't go do this. And quite frankly, we're left feeling empty. I mean, I'm at the age now, my early 40s, where I have so many friends who are miserable because they're, they like pick the easy job, they stayed in the marriage, they had the 2.5 kids, and they're like, this is it? And there were things that they wanted to do that they quite frankly talk themselves out of. And I think that women do this all the time. And that's why in technology, we're left with like dog walking apps and like shooter games because like the innovation that would happen in this room if we did what we were not afraid to do, 
What's, we'd solve every single major world problem there. Yeah. Right. Well, well, and here's what here here's how I feel as a woman of color. They will never let you in. I would never go be CEO. No, they would never let me be CEO of Goldman Sachs. They would never let me be CEO of Goldman Sachs. They would never they would never let me be CEO of Airbnb. I've built one of the one of the largest girls organizations in the world. I have done things that people never thought that I would could do, but they still would not hire me. They still would not promote me. So if you want to like build something, you got to build it yourself. No one, yeah. no one is going to let you in the door and say, here, we'll promote you. And, and, and like almost like, why do we need their permission we anyway? Don't. Right? So but that's I think the we point, do, right? I think like we, we think we, we, think we do. do and that they will. And then we're so d damn disappointed when we work well, our asses yeah. off and it doesn't happen. So, like, I am, like, and I've been thinking a lot about this with Girls Who Code, too. It's like, damn it, like, I'm teaching all these girls to get these companies to hire them, but they probably won't. And so maybe what I should be doing is getting them to start their own companies yeah. and building the next Facebook and the next yeah. Airbnb and the next this and the next that. And I, I think that that's been this kind of coming revel re revelation for me, yeah. both in, like, having the hindsight to look at my career now and then to also look at like what I have learned in looking at, like you said, these structures and whether they're open to us. Yeah. I think the thing that you said that like for me is my response is the thing, if it doesn't scare you, then you shouldn't be doing it. I think every pivotal moment I've had in my career, it's been when I've chosen to step into the fear. Mm -hmm. When I've like, kind of been like, I could do this thing that is safe, where I think I know all the answers, I think I know exactly what's gonna happen, and it feels comfortable. Or I could step into this thing that I have no idea what's about to happen, and it's, a, it's quite frankly scary, like just to be walking in and be sort of that blind to what could potentially happen, what could potentially go right or wrong. And I've always said to myself, and, and even when I'm mentoring other young women, do the thing that, scale, that scares you. Because that's when you're going to grow. That's when you're going to learn. Even if you fail, there's so much learning that happens in those moments. Um, and so for me, that has been, that's always been my pivotal moment. Like coming into tech wasn't, there, were, there was a lot of fear, right? Like I had just planned the the biggest march in history. And yet here I was not staying in activism, which in that moment was like, so many people were like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing with your life and your career? And for me, it felt like this is actually the thing that scares me more than, than activism. Like I can, I can go back into activism in the, the way that I was, was doing it tomorrow. This other opportunity, there's so much here that I don't know, I don't understand. I'm not quite sure how it all fits, but it, it's interesting and it does align. And so I'm gonna go for that. And I look back and I have zero regrets. So do the thing that scares you. So one thing that I find really inspiring is that you didn't know how to code yourself or you were afraid and you were doing something completely different. Um, what would you say if you don't know anything about a field, is it okay just to be like, how, how appropriate is it for one to like divulge themselves into something that they don't know anything about, but yeah. know that there is something that you can do to help? Very appropriate. Men do it all the time. Most all of the time, time they the time. don't know what they're doing or all have or experts in any. I mean, I met this, I met this young guy who was like starting a makeup line. I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> like, so, I, but I do think that what motivated me and what probably motivated you is passion. Yeah. I have been, I led my first march when I was 13 years old, like women and girls, opportunity, poverty alleviation has always been like the focal point of my life. I've just done it in different aspects, right? So I saw coding, for me, it was like coding was just, a facet of it, but really it was about these are where the jobs are at. 
we're all going to be left behind because we're not in them. So like, how do I, how do I, how do I make sure that we're included? And so that was really the way, and coding was again, just a vehicle. But, and, and, and to be honest, I think this goes back to the imposter syndrome and the fear. It's until I actually started writing this children's book, I never worried that I'd get in a room like this and y'all would ask me about HTML and Java and how do I do this <laughs> or that, right? But that should have been, I think for a lot of women, right, that's like a, oh no, I can't talk about this subject because I don't, you know, I'm not an expert. in it. It's funny, I mean, in all these years of Girls Who Code, we don't have like... Um, like a celebrity role model that's ever really wanted to affiliate with the organization, even though they love the organization. And I think part of it is like that fear of imposter of like, I don't feel comfortable talking about something that I can't do myself. Mm -hmm. And men do not feel that way at all. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I think that that's absolutely right. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, you you have something to offer. And I think so often we underestimate the skills that we bring to the table, right? Like there's a connective tissue that you had to what you're doing mm -hmm. now. There's a connective tissue to what I'm doing now from what I was doing. And I think that that exists. Like if you're interested in something, there's probably some something there that you've already done that provides you the opportunity to actually go out and do what you want to do. Yeah. Right? Like, even if it's just your passion, even if it's something that you've done, like, on the side as a hobby and no one knew about it, like, you were doing this thing over here and doing it in secret and no one knew, that exists and that gives you the ability to say, I, I can do this. Like, you don't need anyone's permission. You just have to go out and believe in yourself. And I think that that's, that's the part yeah. that, men do so well like they just have this belief in themselves that I think women we often doubt ourselves we all sit the time. back and yeah all the know, time want to be perfect That's or right. like think about all of the things that we haven't done yeah. that haven't prepared us and forget about all of the things that yeah. we have done that have prepared us it's like why men apply for a job if they meet 60 percent of the qualifications and for women it's a hundred right and that's why and even when you have the hundred you're still, you're still like, like well, I, don't I don't know, know. I don't know right. <laughs> Can I do right, this? Right, right. <laughs> I feel like there was a, oh, yeah, right here. Sorry, your hand. I know. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I'm from a rural area. Um, so in high school, coding, technology, all those, like this conversation, it was not a thing. It was yeah. more so about education. I'm going into the education field, the medical field. Um, or um, a, having a business or either a farm. That's just how rural it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my thing is, is like, um, in coming to New York City, I understand like exposure is key um, as a child. However, I wanted to understand like what um, do you see as some of the strategies that you could possibly use to further this into rural areas yeah. to actually incorporate some children who may not have the exposure or the economic um, yeah. means to go to the, the closest uh, metropolitan area to actually capitalize on this opportunity. A thousand percent. And most of the we're, our, we have we have goals around rural areas. So we just launched our summer immersion program in Arkansas. Um, you, we have clubs basically, and we, we go to like Missouri and Utah, and North Carolina and South Carolina. And it's hard, you know. Sometimes school districts are two schools, and or one, and like there's no you know there's no Wi-Fi in the home or the schools. Like we have a club in in, in Carrollton, Ohio, where it's like the girls meet twice a week at the library because that's the only place that has Wi-Fi. And the thing is that I find interesting is like so many of those communities, their jobs have been automated by technology. Yep. And so they get it. And you know, Ob President Obama used to always say like, the last jobs to go will be the humans telling the computers what to do. Like they understand that. And so they are desperate for their kids to actually learn. There's just not a lot of programs out there. So, um, and even if you think about, I have to, I really want to go, but like farms are so sophisticated right now. Like they're, they're basically yeah. all run essentially by technology. by technology. And so you need, you actually, and, and lots of times folks don't want to leave their communities. And so I've met a lot of some girls who co teachers who like went to major in computer science and went back to the community and are freelancing and helping on the farm while they're teaching coding. So like there's a massive, massive, massive opportunity there and we're doing a lot in those communities. So thank you for that. 
Hi. Um, my name's Kennedy. I'm a transfer student, um, and I'm a sophomore. I'm also about to turn 20, so I guess my question would be, as you guys have been mentors to, like, young women and people my age, um, what is, like, something that you see in them that you would want to speak to when it comes to, like, deciding what they want to do? Because I guess my major is I'm undecided. I'm coming from, like, a performance arts background, and I'm really trying to go after what my passion is. So I feel like also I've been a mentor to students in, in my community, and I feel like a lot of themes come up where I have to speak to that in a new girl that I'm getting or something mm -hmm. like that. So just as someone who is looking to be mentored, I guess, what would you speak to to people my age? Well, I think for me, it's two things. So one is it's okay to change your mind. Um, I changed my major um, after my freshman year in college um, and undergrad and felt like I had to, again, had to get it right. Like my parents were like, you're going to go to school, you're going to graduate in four years. And I chose a major that you know, I was like, okay, I'm never gonna work in this major, but I have a plan. Like my plan is I'm gonna go to law school and I'm gonna do this. And like, I had it all mapped out. And then I graduated and I changed my mind. And I remember thinking about that period in school, how I, how I knew like what the plan was, I had mapped it out. And almost feeling like, am I a failure because I didn't do those things? And in reality, where I sit now, I realize I've changed direction a few times and the path is never wrong. I think the other thing that I would say is um, living in a social media world where you see people and they're seemingly, they seemingly have it all figured out while you're trying to figure, out, figure it out. There's this sense of like competition, like you're not good enough because your life doesn't look like this Instagram worthy life that probably isn't real, that they probably, you know, that they left out all of the hard days when they were bawling their eyes out because they felt like they hadn't gotten it right. Um, and just to remind yourself, like the path to success is not a straight line. Um, I, I, I still have to remind myself of, of this right now. Hi, oh my God. I love that woman. Um, the path to success is not a straight line. Like I, I have to remind myself this a, a lot because there are moments where, you know, I'll get like an article and like there'll be all this press and I'll have speaking opportunities and seemingly at the top. And then there, I will drop and there will be a period where there's nothing, mm. where there's silence. And I feel like no one knows what I'm doing. My work is like, doesn't mean anything. And then I'll go and do something in the community. And then I'm like, okay, it matters. Like what I'm doing matters. And it's not just about what people see. It's about how, how I'm changing people's lives, how, I'm, how the work that I'm doing is impacting people how I'm creating space and opportunity for other people to achieve their dreams. That's the real, that's the real thing that's important. Yeah, that's powerful. I, I, and I think to add to that, one is like, um, I mean, you, you said you're, where are you? There you are. You're, you're in performance, right? So like you get rejected all the time, I'm sure, right? We get rejected all the time. And I think it's so important for you to build your resiliency. Yeah. People told me no a thousand times. Girls are like, that's a stupid idea. I can't even tell you how many times people said that to me and how many times they told me I wasn't the one and I wasn't ready and you can't do this and you can't do that. So like people will tell you no and you will want to give up, right? Because it's easy to give up, but you can't. And so that in many ways becomes like a meditation and a practice uh, that I think is very important. And I think especially in this world of like helicopter parenting and da 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 like we've We've coddled most of you in ways that, I mean, my mother never read my college application. She didn't even know where I applied to school. Right? Same here. So it's it's, but it's different, like in 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 for for your generation. And so that that rejection, that resiliency, 
is oftentimes you're learning that at 20. When we learned it in like 12. So that's really important. And, and I think the other thing, and this is kind of what Janae was saying too, is I, see, I always say to, I always think it's like, if you don't have a life of purpose, then you don't have a life at all. And like, and to me, like my mantra is like, I follow the people, I follow the people, I follow the people, right? And I, I think it's very easy to like follow the credential, follow the hype, follow the celebrity, follow the likes, right? And that's very easy then to forget what, you're, what the point of it is. I love watching that little Greta on TV. I love it. She embodies exactly what, I, exactly what I'm talking about, right? She doesn't care about the, the, the TV and the screens and the fame and the this and the that. She has a very singular focus. That's it. And I think if all of us can find, I mean, I have found that in my life. I think you have found that in your life. Like, that's what I wish for each of you. Like, if you can find that, all the noise doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mess with you, you know, in the way that I think it, it can because of the world that we live in. Does that make sense? Oh, one more. Yes. How are you? Thank you for being here, and I really appreciate all the candor and, and honesty in this conversation. Um, I'm about twice her age, plus <laughs> a couple, probably have a background closer to yours, and I work in te arts and technology, and I'm just curious, I've been, I would say, fortunate enough to work with a lot of female-led teams over the years, even now, at this point in my career. I'm running into certain you know, gender dynamics, surprisingly so, so I'm just curious, how do you contextualize when you're working with your teams, your organizations, or your girls in, okay, you could get all the skills, you can get all the merits on paper, you can maybe even be let in the door. Once you get there, there may be doubts, assumptions about your presence there, resentments, and I find myself, you know, not only like doing twice the amount of work, twice as good, yeah. et cetera, but also having to manage a lot of emotions <laughs> around other people that have assumptions or just, just my mere presence is creating certain feelings that are, I'm sure, subconscious, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm just curious as to, you know, I'm not asking for like a women in workplace book from either of you, but <laughs> what it is that you tell people in your organizations or, you know, your programs in preparation of you could do all this work, work so hard, show up there and maybe be feeling these things towards you and, you know, just yeah. to prepare for them or how to even navigate that. So I feel like it's like all of us have to be like Cardi B, like no Fs given. Like what I would push you on, whether it's an all-female workplace, because I've heard this from folks who work in all-female workplaces, and I've heard this from folks who work in male workplaces. Like who cares what they think about you? Like we're too conditioned to want to be liked. And whether it's in a girl dynamic where all of a sudden we feel like we're in a sorority school, you know what I mean? We're in that thing where all the girls are having a party and we're not invited to it and you don't like me and I feel all these feelings about it. Or it's with in a male environment where we feel like, again, it's the same thing, why am I still trying to impress you? It, it goes back to the fact of like, how do we get to a place where we can believe in ourselves and our work and like separate the emotion from what's happening here? And, and, and I think that that is, it's, it's something that, quite frankly, men have been more conditioned to do, you know, and it's harder for us because, again, we've been socialized to want to care what other people think about us. And to me, it's about, like, the re-socialization of that feeling so it doesn't feel so personal. I think the only other thing I would add is if, if, this, is, if this is something where there's a power dynamic at play, meaning someone is making decisions that impact your ability to grow or to, you know, get a promotion or get a raise. Um, you know, there is a lot of work that we all have to do to dismantle those systems. Sometimes we don't reap the rewards of the system being dismantled, right? Like, so when there are glass ceilings and when there are sticky floors, Sometimes we are not the ones who get to see ourselves break that ceiling. Um, sometimes we are just 
someone who creates another shatter in the glass that allows someone else to ascend to that position or to, you know, to, to break through fully. Um, and so I, I think that to Reshma's point, like we, you can't so much concern yourself with what other people think because then that leads to additional feelings of imposter syndrome and, yeah. and, and almost takes away the reason why you're there. Yeah. It's really about what, what can you do to advance your work to advance opportunity for someone who's behind you or under you or, or what have you, um, and how can you help further dismantle the system that prevents women and women of color and um, people with disabilities and LGBTQ communities from being in that space or in those rooms? And I think what you're talking about is being in an all-women workspace and some of the challenges. Is that... Go ahead. No. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Women are right. So yeah. do you feel comfortable saying that to the person? Because like, I, I also feel like some of the, th I know I do this, like I know there's a dynamic happening mm -hmm. and I feel it and I go home and I feel like oppressed by the, you know, by what's yeah. happening. But then I'm also mad at myself that I just didn't, Articulate it or confront what I'm saying. Do you feel comfortable actually saying like, like you're not taking me seriously because it's from me? Yeah. But but it's Sorry. for the project, but right? For the project, mm -hmm. in order to achieve the goals for the whole team yeah. and everyone involved, right? Of like, okay, whatever it takes to kind of just move us forward, so everyone succeeds. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a hard balance, right? Or you know, you're going to know sometimes when you're like, okay, I just got to play politics and push it along, or I have to confront the situation and, and use this as a moment to educate or fight the patriarchy. <laughs> and if you can find <laughs> allies, I mean, if if they exist find an ally who can and will be like your cheerleader, if you will. So when yeah. you have an idea, someone to say, that's a great idea. And if it's, if it's a guy, that's better to someone to say, like to help dismantle that system, to help say, I have privilege in this situation. How yes. can I help elevate her ideas? Totally. And how can I, how can I extend? And, and maybe even if I'm the guy, how can I have a conversation with this other guy who's stepping on your ideas to say, this is not cool. This is a great idea. The only reason you don't like it is because it's from her. Like, and, you know, using, using the ally system to help dismantle yeah. uh, the, the systems of oppression also, I think, is important. I think we have time for, if you don't mind, two more oh, questions. Sure. Would that be good? Uh, One, two. Um, one thing I'm realizing more and more, like every time I go to a talk like this, or if I see um, like Women's Appreciation Day, it's only women appreciating women and men not appreciating women. And I feel like disappointed that not enough men are at this conversation or posting more about their like female friends or their mothers or their sisters. How do we get more men to stand up like and be like, hey, like, we have one, but why not have a whole community of them? And what what can we make a change? How do we how do we do that? I think it happens on a micro level, like in, in as much as we can have the macro conversation to a room like this, and hopefully it, this these messages are landing with men in ways that make them think, and maybe make them act in ways that are different, or and if they've already been ceding some of their power, hopefully they will continue to do yeah. that and maybe even take it a step further. But I do think that a lot of times these conversations also happen on micro levels. And so like on the one-on-one -on -one with men that you know who may not understand, um, you know, they may not understand and they may not feel like they're welcome in a space like this or that their conversation or questions are appreciated in a space like this. To have that to have that dialogue in a more meaningful way. I've, I do it often with guys I know, 
friends and, and family members. And I've spent my life sort of addressing injustice, even within like my own family structure. I know my cousin is here. And like when I was a teenager, my dad did not want me to date until I was like 16. And I was like, but you let our guy, my mm -hmm. guy cousin's date, like, no, we're going to dismantle this. And so now when my niece is, she's seven, she's totally not dating anyone <laughs> at all. <laughs> but when she's ready, she will be equitably dating at the age that my nephew will be dating. Yeah. And I will ensure that. And they know that like, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this. Um, and so I think it is having those micro conversations to talk about how, you know, how, how you would like men to, to cede their power to you. Thank you. It's just a comment. Uh, my daughter attended the, the, uh, the, the program of uh, Girls Who Code in Newark, New Jersey. Oh, good. And uh, she enjoyed it. Uh, the majority of the women, of the girls there, or the women uh, were women of color. She mm -hmm. made uh, good friends. It was, a, uh, she, it was an excellent experience, very challenging. At the end, I asked her, what do you think? Are you interested in that? She said, no, I wasn't. But I was disappointed, but uh, the experience was very good for her. It's not too late. Don't give up on it. <laughs> give me her phone number. <laughs> now, I think, listen, if you had asked my father, would his daughter be running an organization to teach girls to coding, he would have thought you were crazy. So you just never know, you know? And I think part of it is just seeding the idea in her head, reminding her that she doesn't have to choose. I don't know what she does want to do, but you can do both, right? And I think now that she's had that experience, you know, like I said, one part of it is coding, but the other part is bravery. Mm -hmm. You just talked about how she, most of the girls there were girls of color. You know, we live in the times where our schools are more segregated than they've ever been before. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the healing, like, you know, the, the sisterhood that happens in these classrooms, in many ways, that will be as much of Girls Who Code's impact on the world as it will be in closing the gender gap in, in technology. So tell her, I said, hi, give me your phone number. <laughs> and she can walk into a room and say, I know how to code. Yeah. Exactly. She can claim it. I want to thank our thank speakers. You. Thank and you. Janae, you were remarkable. <laughs> you gave us lots of insight, lots of courage, lots of thoughts of how to be brave and courageous and not perfect, and to go forth and follow the passion. It was really inspirational to hear the questions and to hear your answers. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.